and very pleased to have you. Thank so you. One, thank you. So one of the things that I, I love to talk about and learn about is what I call the, the birth of leadership. And I'm fascinated with people's foundations. You know, their, their role models, their parents, their grandparents, their mentors, their champions, you know, sort of their growing up and the right. things that inspired them and, and maybe even some of the things that uh, were discouraging, but still you were able to able come. Uh, can we can we go down that path, Phyllis? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> uh, thank you for having me and uh, on the show. Uh, you know, when I think about my, um, you know, foundation, you know, um, you know, you have to, you know, my parents were born in the 1931, 1928, and uh, I come from a family of 11 children. Oh. Uh, so my mom raised her eight siblings uh, alongside her kids as well. So, you know, so, you know, I came from uh, parents that really, you know, they really went through the, the tough stuff, the, the struggling, you know, in the, in the South, I was born in North Carolina, outside of uh, Charlotte is where my, my parents uh, lived. And so when I hear today, my mom's 91 years old, and I've been so blessed to be able to to really get a lot of uh, history from her. And mm -hmm. you know, she's told me so many stories. And I think sometimes when I think about the resilience that I've had throughout my career and the things that I've been able to do, I think I owe a lot of that to the resilience that she and my father had and just really knowing, uh, you know, entrepreneurship didn't just begin with me. Mm -hmm. You know, they had little stores that where they they helped other families and communities. And they, you know, they they had uh, my mom was, you know, had a you really would be a, a large bakery today if you look at the amount of food that she used to cook <laughs> for non-black people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was always making cakes and and doing, you know, Sunday dinners for other people. So, um, so, so when I think about the foundation, you know, coming from a family of 11 kids, coming from a mother and a father, and really, um, you know, uh, my parents used to instill in us education, how important that was, you know, to get an education, go to school, because the ticket, the ticket out was, was really this, your brain. Yes. And, the, and they used to always say, look, we, we don't come from money. We don't have a lot of, have a, we have enough to get by. And, and if you want to get over and not just get by, you got to use this to get over. And uh, and so um, and so that was kind of really how the, the you know, my father and my mother, you know, prepped all of us uh, with those necessary tools. And I, I call them mental tools. We, we grew up with mental tools. And this is how how to how to be able to uh, to overcome and adapt and be flexible, be adjustable, and and be resilient and and to be sustainable. And they, and, I, and when, when I when I think about that, all those things throughout the journey of my life, I've been able to apply all those things over and over and over again by watching, you know, the way my parents lived. Um, we used to uh, when I grew up, uh, you know, when all the siblings was at home. And I'm number 10. And I remember this uh, sitting around the table. My father would ask, you know, everybody to talk about what your value card was. What's your value card? Like, what value do you bring to this family? And every single one of us had a different value card. So how the there was power in that. Because when I left home and entered into the world that didn't look like me, I didn't walk into a room and I've never walked into the room not knowing what my value card is. Even when people try to devalue your card, mm -hmm. you know what it is. And it's up to you on whether or not you play that card or not. And so when I thank God for having parents that, that made us say what that value was, you know, I'm a leader. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a nurturer on this. My sister who was a nurturer, she used to say she was a nurturer. She was a team builder. She went into nursing. You know, my sister who went in the Air Force and Navy and all of us had uh, that value card and end up going into careers that mirrored the value card that we grew up repeating over and over and over again. So and what, and what was your value card? You know, I used to say my value card is I'm a great leader. I'm a leader. And 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 uh, and I pride myself on being able to go rally up everybody to come to dinner, even though I was the youngest. And say, hey, everybody, it's time to eat. Because, you know, where I grew up, you only ate one time. 
And that wasn't you coming in, you warming up food throughout the night. It was one dinner meal. That was it. So I'm sure you can identify with that. So how does, when did you remember, or when do you recall that, that value card, that leadership sort of sprung into you? Do you recall, Phyllis? Yeah, I think I was, um, I, I was, gosh, I had to be in uh, middle school and, uh, you, you know, and I was, I was, uh, at, at the time, uh, I was in a school where, um, you know, it was um, becoming, it was an all black school that now they were busing and mixing all the students in, from all districts. And so um, it became 70% uh, white. And I remember the black students saying, we're, we're not, we're, you know, we're, you know, we had, you know, they wanted to have a revolt against one of the teachers. And I just remember saying, you know, you stand in front of this classroom and, and my classmates still remind me of this today, telling these students, listen, settle down. There's a way to do things in a certain order. I'm this young kid telling people this, like, we're not going to go and, 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 uh, attack this teacher we're gonna we're gonna give her all the reasons she should listen to us and and to this day people say well we knew you were gonna grow up and be a leader you remember that time when you were in the sixth grade and you made everybody write down the reasons that teachers need to pay attention and uh so i, I you know i think about that moment uh you know stepping into that role as a leader and that followed me throughout and when i went into the military Gosh, it was a no brainer. I love the time that I spent 20 plus years in the military. You know, it gave me the opportunity to really operate at the, at the highest level. And, and, I, and I say it's the time where I realized the power of operating in your greatness. When you know there's a difference between being a good leader and a great leader. And I, pro and I wanted to be a great leader. And you have to work at being a great leader. You have to have great mentors. You have to, have, you have to be coachable. You have to you know, um, be able to take advice and be, be mentored. And I was willing to do all of those things in order to become a great leader because I knew there was a big difference. Okay. No, thank you for sharing that, Phyllis. So let me, let me ask you this, and I'm going to come back to the military for a second. Tell me what role race if any played growing up there in North Carolina, Phyllis? Ah, you know, I would tell you this. When I was um I remember uh being in uh maybe about the uh maybe fourth or fifth grade and there was a Asian American student and I mean that showed up in our classroom. Nobody in my classroom had ever seen and we didn't know what she was. We, she, this, we just said she was mixed, didn't know what she was. But for whatever reason, I became, um, you know, we just became instant friends. And I remember leaving my neighborhood, going to her neighborhood and could not. And, and today, I, you know, you go to another neighborhood, he goes, oh, my God. There are castles on not not mansions. I I, I was saying, oh, there's a castles in another neighborhood, and and I remember going there thinking people live like this, and and you know just you know just and and we and we re remained friends for for sixty years. Um, uh, but uh, you know I I remember there was such a divisiveness in the black neighborhood and and the white neighborhood. But I was in the middle. I was in the middle trying to bridge the gap and, and tell my Black friends, it's okay to have diverse friendships. So I was, I had a very diverse group of friends very early in life. And I think that really helped shape me uh, for, for the journey and the path that I've been able to take. Um, and, and all of my siblings also had very diverse friends. So, so, but that was not encouraged by my father. It was not encouraged by my father. My father was uh, was not an advocate of bringing white people to his home, <laughs> and he was very clear. And my white friends was very clear that they were not welcome in his mm -hmm. home. And uh, and so, but my mother was she was a big champion of you know being diverse, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone, going to look and get another perspective on how other people live and how they think. Because knowing, you know, having those friendships will help you navigate through life 
in a way that you may not, you know, have the opportunity had you not had this perspective before you left home. So it was, so, and I, and I would prep them before they, you know, my father was hell on wheels and I would prep them before they went to my home. Like, you know, my, my father might pull out a shotgun <laughs> and tell you to get off his property. Don't, you can still come back another day, but, but he's going to scare you. And he would do things like that. And my siblings don't like for me to talk about that today, but they know it's true. Mm. <laughs> but uh, let, yeah. let me, let me ask you this, Phyllis, and, I, and there may be an obvious reason, but I w- I'd love for you to answer it if you could. What was your father's reasoning? You know, he would say that he had been, you know, he looked at, uh, you know, you got to remember, my father was born in 1928. Okay. And uh, so they grew up in um, uh, his grandfather it was slavery in North Carolina. And, the you know, the, the, the land that they owned part of was part of the plantation. So he still had a lot of bitter feelings on how. Uh, you know, you know, at the time in 1928, and you get to, you know, this was way before the civil rights. Sure. So you, you Jim Crow and all those things growing up. So his experience was very different. And and so the older siblings probably experienced more of what my father did, more so than the, the, the bottom half. And so as times was changing and the civil rights and all of that, it was a different era. So I think, um, but but what I would say what I loved about my father was, and, I, and God knows I get reminded all the time, you're just like your father. <laughs> That's a scary thing, you know, but in, in a lot of ways I am. But my, my father was also very curious. He was very curious about things and he was very curious about the world in a different way of what, what other black people live like around the world. And, and so he was very curious. So when I went into the military, um, he was very curious on what that experience was going to be like being outside the boundary, uh, being outside those boundaries, uh, because he had lived only in North Carolina. OK, thank you, Phyllis. So tell me then, when does you talk about the military was college, college and the military? When does that yeah. sort of come into focus for you? Yeah. So, you know, um, so I would tell you, sadly, what I think about um you know, growing up with 11 siblings, it was, you know, you work, you, you go to, you go to school, you get a job and you go to college. And it was get a job and go to college. Wasn't just go to college and get a job. So if you think about that process, it's tell, you know, my parents was like, look, we don't have money to send everyone to college. We don't have um, the, the necessary means for boarding and all those things. And so, so to, uh, and I realized uh, it was over a summer. Uh, my one of my older sisters was uh, had gone into the Air Force. She'd gone to college, and then she'd gone into the Air Force. And I went to visit her during the summer break. And when I went to the um, Air Force base, my God, I saw something I had never seen before. And it was the exposure to the military. And what and what did I see? I walked onto a military air. Uh, uh, air, uh, military um, Air Force Base, and on that base, I saw women coming off the flight line, and I, and they all had on these jumpsuits and you know hats and all these ribbons, and they were coming off the flight line, and it was this parade, and I saw all the helico- uh, all these planes were on the runway, and they were all coming off, and it was a whole squadron of female pilots. At the time, I didn't know they were pilots. You know, I'm this young black kid, and never been this close to airplanes before and and when I saw them and and I said oh I wonder why they're coming away from the airplanes and and my sister said they're pilots I said they are the ones that actually flying those airplanes and she said yeah and they were it was the first black female pilot in the air force and uh, that flew the uh, big aircraft and when I saw that I was just absolutely floored and I stood there in awe of every single one of those women walked by and, and, and I saw empowerment. I saw leadership. I saw just, you know, a, a career. And in that moment, it was something that I couldn't turn off. And even as I went back and was going to school, I couldn't get that image out of my head of seeing myself. And, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so that summer, the next summer, I made a decision 
that I was going to go into the military. And what branch did you go into, Phil? I ended up enlisting in the army. Yeah. And when I went to the military, and I and I say this, uh, and I, I've often said this, it actually was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, because I grew up in a house where I felt like it was boot camp every day <laughs> with my father. I, mean, I tell you, my father was hell on wheels, yeah. and no drill sergeant could ever compare to my dad. <laughs> so by the time I went to boot camp, I was like, oh my God, I mean, I could do this all day long, because I had grown up in a house where there was discipline, there was focus, that was, you know, he was, he was, he was, um, he was a, a stickler on being disciplined every morning, getting up on time, you know, making your bed was just a regiment that we had with 11 kids, you can imagine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had set uh, we had set duties in the house. If you had dishwashing duty on this, I mean, it was just, I'm telling you, I still have PTSD from <laughs> growing up in that house, but, <laughs> but, but. Uh, well, let, but, let me ask you though. So you were, you were so influence visiting your sister in terms of the Air Force, why the Army versus the Air Force? Ah, that's a great question. Because the Air Force had a waiting list. Back then, they only allowed so many women in each branch at certain times of the year. Okay. And the Air Force had already met a quota. And I definitely wasn't going into Marine Corps. <laughs> and I didn't think I could swim to get into the Navy. <laughs> so, so the <laughs> Army was a great choice. Plus, the Army had more career fields open to women. And so where, where were you first stationed? Do you recall? So I went to um, boot camp at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And then I got stationed at, um, uh, so uh, I, I went to uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia. And it was a big infantry command and big deployments and, and lots of soldiers. I mean, just, it was just an incredible place to be and, I learned a lot. And then shortly thereafter, I went to uh, Washington, D.C., many tours uh, overseas and uh, several tours back to the Washington, D.C. area, the Pentagon uh, uh, National Security Agency. So I had a variety of mm -hmm. different uh, 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 military uh, stations okay. all over. So at, at that time, in terms of the percentage of women in the Army, I mean, how, how small was it? You know, uh, so I was one of the first classes in the Army that integrated basic training where men and women trained together. Okay. That was uh, that was in 1979. Okay. And uh, so we were, um, we, it was the first test. And um, so we did everything together, everything from weapons training to not, uh, you know, males was on one side of the barracks, we were on the other side. And and Lord knows the army had to make a lot of changes because it was it was a new it was a test and Fort Jackson was the uh, was a test so you you, you have to think um, at the time um, you, for probably for, for about every uh, I would say you know two hundred male soldiers was one female soldier okay yeah. and in, in brief I mean what was that what was that like for you well so again. I, you know, I would tell you, for me, I grew up in a large family. So I was used to having brothers. I was used to roughing it with my brothers. I was used to getting along well with other women because I, I grew up. So I think, you know, having that strong foundation of teamwork and, you know, everybody had responsibilities and everybody had to learn how to lead in, in my house. So when I went into the military, it, it was like, OK, this is, you know, this is easy wheezy because I've been doing this all my life. So so it wasn't very difficult for me. And but I all but I love the the fact that I, you know, that you you had the op so many opportunities to lead. I would always volunteer. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll be in charge. I'll take over. I'll do. It. And I love that. But that but but I didn't realize at the time how much of that in, was in my DNA. Just and, and it goes back to what I was telling you, that value card, you know, knowing no matter what room you show up, that value card becomes so dominant in the room that you play it every chance you get because you know that card all so well. OK, so you said you spent 20 plus years in the mm -hmm. army. And what was what was your final rank, Phyllis? Uh, uh, Master Sergeant. Okay. Got out as an E8. So tell me then about your value card is leadership. And you go into the military, you spend 20 plus years there. And 
we can just briefly in terms of mentors or champions, but what are you learning from the military that enhances your leadership ability, Phyllis? Yeah, so, you know, so you gotta remember the military went through many iterations of, um, of you know, we went through the largest sexual harassment scandal in the history. That was Tailhook, if you remember. Yes, okay. And that was when the Navy broke their big scandal, and then it went through the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, throughout the entire military. Tailhook opened up um, what today would, you know, some of the things that women have gone through. And so I came in the military right when Tailhook was just becoming, uh, you know, they were just breaking that that story. Okay. And, uh uh, but that didn't, but then there came a bit of retaliation. So you had tail hook, you had the exposure, but then you had years of retaliation for speaking out against leaders. So, so what it taught me, so that part of my career was about how fearless are you going to be? You know, are you going to be a victim or are you going to be proactive and become fearless? And so I decided to take the path of being, you know, you know, uh, the, this fearless leader that, would report an incident that would stand by the troops, would would stand up. And so later in my, um, uh, as, as you follow my journey, I start this nonprofit with Viola called Shoulder Up. So when Shoulder Up was launched with Viola Davis and I, it came from the era of when the first part of my career, when women would get together and shoulder up. Shoulder Up was about let's, let's, let's bring our voices together to create change in the lives of a system that is broken. That's what that meant. And so uh, just a different version of it, of, of today, today, the way I use it, but that's really what that meant in that time. And then you still had the racism. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times that I had senior leaders use the N word. Uh, I mean, you know, and I would report it and, there would be retaliation and I would fight it to the letter of the law and I would go to hearings. And, and so imagine today when you uh, in corporate America, you start fighting the system. And a lot of people, I would tell you, uh, Adam, are afraid to fight the system. Yeah. But this, but great leaders are not afraid to challenge the system in order to fight the system. You have to be willing to challenge it first. So so then so you go through sexism, racism. And then all the other isms fell, came after that. And you could think of all of them. And then you had, went through the era of don't ask, don't tell, which was huge for leaders who had uh, military members who um, uh, during the, um, you know, the, the, during the era of don't ask, don't tell, you had to be able to support troops who were coming out and in the military and there were retaliations in your command. And so what it taught, taught me a few things is about, you know, number one, you know, loyalty and commitment and, uh, you know, and resiliency. And I would tell you that the, the, the thing that um, on the tail end of my career, I, I had to deal with PTSD, um, soldiers coming back from the Gulf War. And, and, uh, and I was at the conflict, the Gulf War, because no soldier, no uh, leader was equipped to deal with PTSD because they weren't talking about PTSD in the way that we talk about it today. Yeah. And so you had a high number of suicides happening in the military and not, and leaders weren't properly trained on how, um, how to help people navigate through um, through tough times of coming back from the war zone. And so as a leader, you go, and I, and this is what I, what I commend a lot of military leaders today is that if you spent 10, 20 years in the military, you can't tell me that it doesn't stretch you every year. There's something new that's happening in that, those, in those organizations that make you a better, I always say that make you or break you. And in my case, I was willing for it to make me. So it mean it meant take you know it meant um, you know taking off the mask and saying, "Listen, I don't know this. How do I become a better leader?" And communicating with um, the troops. And so I think everything I learned in the military certainly prepped me for the next chapter of my life. No, th thank you, Phyllis. And that's that's extraordinary. Um, and that's we could spend hours just talking about what you just talked about. That's fascinating.
then tell me how, how do you transition then after those 20 plus years in the army in terms of what are you thinking your next step is going to be i mean we, we now know you're, you're this phenomenal entrepreneur but where did that sort of come from phyllis you, you know my last and i would tell you this like my last assignment and i always said this and i even today you know, I started to feel the military was shifting, it was changing. And you know, even as an entrepreneur in your business, when you know your organization is shifting, it's changing the culture, and maybe and you have to say, you know, am I am I um embracing the the uh the next generation in a way that I'm prepping, um positioning them for me to transition. Okay. You know, and uh and, you know, do I think of succession planning in a way that I'm thinking of it, of bringing that next leader and that uh, that emerging leader to the top so that I can exit out? And, and so I started and I realized that I was, you know, I was, you know, feeling so compelled to help other women and, and to encourage them to keep going and you'll make it to this rank and then you'll you'll be able to lead. And, and I realized that I had, I was also having a burning desire um, to, to, there was something else that was just like, you know, just kind of nudging at me to say, it's time to go. And so I didn't want to be one of these people that every day people were saying, when are you going to retire? Oh, so I'm, you fit in for a while. You know, you know when it's time to go when people start asking you when you're going, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, when are you going to let, you know, we all know this, right? So, so I, you know, so I didn't want to be that type of leader where people was, was kind of giving you hints that you should be dropping your retirement paper. So I knew that I wanted to leave, but I was, I, I knew that I, I spent two years mentally prepping myself for the next chapter. And I was, and I was so prepared that I was walking in the next chapter before I actually stepped into the next chapter okay. because I, my, my mind was already there and I could always already see myself as an entrepreneur. I knew that I would be a successful entrepreneur because I knew I was willing to put the same level of effort in the next chapter as I had done the first chapter of my life. So, uh, so when I got ready to leave, um, you know, I, I gathered up a whole lot of troops that I had mentored in that last four years and, and, you know, I told them, look, you know, I'm going to leave the military in about a year. And uh, but I'm going to certainly would love to continue to follow you in your careers and if you ever get out. And so I made that transition. And I remember getting out and I was so excited. And I and and I came home and I said, OK, I got to put a vision board together and I'm going to put a vision board together of what the next chapter looks like. And I promise you, if I were to show you that vision board today, Everything on that came to pass. Not one thing on there. I mean, I wrote a check, and um, and then I keep this check. So I wrote this check. I uh, wrote this check. Still have it. And I wrote this check in uh, 1999, and I wrote a check for a million dollars. And I put it on the vision board, and I said, and it was a personal check, and a, to myself, and I said, I'm going to be able to walk in the bank in five years and cash this check. And then five years after that, I walked into the bank and said, hey, I want to cash this check. And they said, we don't have a million dollars in the bank. I said, well, why come you don't have it? They said, well, you have to. That's not how it works if you want a million in cash. And I didn't know that. But uh, but anyway, uh, the point that I'm make, making here is that everything that I believed could be could be possible. And but I it, it wasn't just sticking a check on the board it was manifesting it into and executing the, the labor and, and, and the strategy and all the other things that took for it to, to come to pass. And so that was everything from who do you want to be your first customer? And I remember saying, at and is going to be my first customer. And then the government is going to be my second customer. And here's going to be my executive team. And I wrote down all the people I wanted to be on that executive team. And all those people end up working for me. And, um, and what was the and business so, that you that your first cybersecurity, yes, right. cybersecurity okay. firm, yeah. And so, um, so the business evolved into exactly um, what we had planned, and it didn't come without some hiccups. So, um, and and I have to tell you this funny story, Adam. You know, when you leave the military, you know, you're a senior leader. You got a driver. People are driving you everywhere. You know, they're they you know, you get a schedule in the morning. You you know, they tell you where you're going to go, what time the meetings and the slides and all that stuff. 
And the day I wanted the military, I was like, oh, I don't, well, who's going to do my schedule? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I was realizing I had to now work for myself. And uh, nobody was going to go fetch my car. I had to go get it myself. So, it, you know, so I had, I had a real wake up call and a, a slowly reduced ego. And uh, so I went through that phase and um, realized that, you know, your identity cannot be tied into your title. And I, for so long, the military identity was, you know, I'm a hard charging non-commissioned officer. And when that day left and I was finally out of that uniform, oh, my identity, I had to find it. I had to find who is Phyllis. And, and, and that, that right there was self-discovery. And that was, that, was, that was a lot of work. And I had to be willing to do the work to say, who am I? Who am I to strip off all the titles? And who do you want to become? And that, that's the work that I put in th during that year. And if I had, if, if there's any veterans listening to this, that's the work you got to be willing to do when you leave the military. Because if you ask professional athletes, because I've talked to Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, you know, you name it. And we all have said the same thing. The day you leave the game before the game leaves you. Because what happens is that if you can't leave the game, if you can't leave the military without that title, then your identity will get lost and you'll spend years wondering, trying to figure out. I can't tell you how many professional athletes today that I work with that we talk about this. This is an open forum for us to discuss identity, identity. Interesting. So tell me then, because, you know, we're we're geared toward, you know, kids in school and sort of providing some insight and career ideas in terms of being an entrepreneur. You talk about your value card growing up. You talk about when you left the military, your vision board. What sort of, if, you know, to be for a young person, because they don't teach entrepreneurship, obviously, in school. What was, what would you say to a young person to say, you know, how would I get started to become an entrepreneur? What do I need to learn? What do I need to study? Are there anything that you might suggest, Phyllis? Yeah, so I would say this, for anybody who's thinking about being an entrepreneur, think about a problem you are, that you want to solve. And you just think of a problem, you know, and you say, how can I solve that problem? You know, people never thought in a million years that we'd be riding in a stranger's car, Uber. Somebody said, here's a problem. I hate getting in taxi cabs. This is how the guy basically started Uber. He said, hey, I hate getting into cars, dirty cab driver cars. Would it be nice to just have people who want to drive other people around and make money? And that was, a, and he solved the problem because look at how many people don't use, you know, there's less people that use taxi cab drivers today than anything. So when you think about a problem that you, you would like to solve, then you start looking and you have to do research. Uh, so you research that problem. Who else have tried to solve this problem? How far do they go? What do they do? What are some similar or relevant solutions? And, and when you start to do research, because if, if someone comes to me with an idea and I said, how much research have you done around it? Well, I, I was just talking to my friend. That's not research. Because you got to be willing to put it. Before I started my company, I did research. Remember I told you mentally, I prepared myself two years before I got out of the military. What did I do during that two years? I looked at what does it take to run a business? What do you need? What type of capital? What type of structure? What, what, you know, what type of services? What will the customers look? So I did a lot of research around that. And then I went to talk to other people who were running businesses. What are the pitfalls? What are the rabbit holes? And so there's so much that goes into it because I think if, if you were to do the research then you say, what, what's going to be required of you? And, and, and will you have the level of commitment? Because if you look at the number of startups that, that fall off the cliff the first year, the number is compelling. You know, that, and when you look at 80% of the, the businesses in that first year dive off the cliff, what happens to the other 20%? And then the next year, another 10% is gone. So only 10% survive. And what is it? And if you go to those 10 percenters and you say, what, what did you do initially? They said, I did a lot of research. You know, I did a lot of preparation. 
And so um, you can go out and you can read all the books on entrepreneurship, but, but it starts with you how, and I tell my son this, you have to have a level of drive that says, I'm not going to quit no matter what. I'm not going to quit. I might pivot, but I'm not quitting. There's a difference. I might pivot in my business, but I'm not going to quit. And so don't be afraid to, to go out and, and, um, and, and here's three things I want you to think about. I always have these people on my team. I have my own team. And, 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 I, and I told my son this when he was very young. I said, go out and get your own team. And here's what needs to be on your team. You need an advisor. You need a coach. You need a mentor. And, I, and you need a friend. And, and you need a, uh, a community leader. And, and this is why I say those people, because you need to be in touch with the community. What's happening? You know, supporting the community. How can you? And, and this is your community service because you because because when you're giving to your community, you're more engaged. And when you think about a mentor, you so when I think of a coach and advisor and a mentor, an advisor is going to basically advise you to say, listen, have you thought of this? Have you considered this? Here's here's what I would have you think of. They're advising you. A mentor is somebody who's done it. They've been there, done that. They've started a business. They've started. They've sold. They've they've merged. They've done a lot of things. And that's the difference. An advisor is just going to advise you on things. A mentor is going to mentor you. A coach says, "Look, you know, I'm going to take your skill sets that you have, and I'm going to coach you." So 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 if you think about this. You know, um, uh, people who who Serena Williams needed a coach, even though she had great talent, she was uh, she had natural talent, but she still had a tennis coach. Right. And so if you want to perfect your skills, you go and you get a business coach. So if you want to learn from the best, you go get a mentor. If you want somebody to advise you as you go through this, you get an advisor. Mm -hmm. And so and then and so that's the difference that even on my team today, you know, and I've switched them out over time, over years, as, as I have evolved to different levels. And, and I said, you know, um, when I wanted to take a company public, I didn't know how to take a company public. I didn't know how to, what the new, how to, you know, list a company on the New York Stock Exchange. So I went to somebody who had been, who worked in capital markets for 35 years. I went to somebody who had been on the New York Stock Exchange that worked on the trading floor for 40 years. And these people poured into me for 90 days. I just sucked it up. And by the time I got on Bloomberg, you would have thought that I had been in this business 30 years. Because, because I knew that I couldn't afford to get on MSNBC, Bloomberg, without knowing what I was talking about. But I was willing to go invest in a coach, an advisor, and a mentor in the industry and what I wanted to perfect. That's fascinating. And just really quickly, Phyllis, in th those initial three positions, how long did it take you to find the people that were sort of right for you? Um, so when I was in the military and... Um, so when I was in the military, you know, the military teaches you to have those three, like who's coaching you, advising you and, and mentoring you. And so you, you kind of um, and, and here's what I would say to anyone when you when you're looking for those, you, you, you they, there needs to be a buy in on both sides. So when people come to me and they said, hey, I'm looking for a mentor, you would be fantastic. And and, and, I, and I have them go through why they feel that as I'm a great fit for them. And, and, you know, and I would listen to them. And if they've been done homework, they don't know much about you. They don't, and I would say, so tell me, what, what do you expect of me? What, what, what do you hope to get from me? And then I will give them the things that I expect from a mentee. And most people aren't used to that. Because I would say, I expect for a mentee to show up and be available and to be ready and to, and to be a great student, I would expect for a mentee to do their homework and not be a time waster. And, and I don't get on a call jibber jabbing about nothing. You know, let's have a clear cut agenda that we're going to stick to. Let's have some metrics. We're going to measure how well we're doing for each other. That, that's a professional mentorship relationship. Most people like to go out and just say everybody's their mentor. But listen, it's just like a marriage. Get it in writing. You know, hey, let's get in writing. 
What, what are we doing for each other? What's the relationship like? How solid is this relationship? And then uh, as, you, as you evolve, you may need another mentor for something else that, that your mentee or mentor may not, uh, may not have the expertise or the skill set uh, for this next level that you're, you're trying to get to, right? So I, I've often had uh, Adam mentors that have turned in, a, where I have one mentee, she calls them friend tours, because your relationship over the years of 20 years of mentorship have evolved into a solid friendship that where you, you're now, it's, um, it's a full circle. I'm now mentoring them and advising them on things where I have more of the expertise. Tell me what, what does power mean to you? Ah, you know, uh, Adam, I'll tell you this. This, this is, um, this, I, I, I like to, well, th I, this is m what I feel. I feel that every single one of us, every day, we get to wake up and decide who we want to be. You know how much power is in that? It, 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 it's so much power in your identity. So if I wake up uh, and this morning, I said, you know, I want to be outrageous. <laughs> I want to be outrageous all day. I'm just going to be incredibly outrageous. Who who does who's to tell me that I can't be? Yeah. There's power in you just declaring who you want to be. If I wake up tomorrow and I say, you know what, I'm I'm going to be, you know, this I'm just going to be fun. I'm just going to exude fun all day. Whatever that is, we get to be right. But here is something else where I believe we have the most power as people of color. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in a room and we're the only one. Do you know how much power you have when you are the only? You have so much power when you're the only woman, you're the only male, you're the only Black, you're the only Latino, and so on and so on, the only veteran. We can go on to many times you're going to walk in the room and you are the only. It is what you do the moment you recognize that you are the only. There is power in being the only. And I would tell you this, I exercise that my full power in being the only. See, I'm the only person of color on two boards that I sit on, two public boards. And so I give them my perspective in a way that only I could give that perspective. Only I could give you the perspective on the lack of minorities in a company, the lack of minorities on a team, the lack of minorities on the executive board. I, only I can give you that perspective. Or if I walk in the room and I'm the only one at a conference and, and, I, might, and I might give you a perspective that you weren't expecting. But, but, it, but, it's for, it, but it's for me to use that power to change the outcome of that room. So you have the power to change the outcome of the room where you're the only. But oftentimes we go in and we use the only as really as a uh, we walk in that room and there's an automatic defeat. We're defeated. Oh, there's nobody else in here. It's 20 to one. You see, I like to go in and say it's one to 20. Yeah. So it's my job. It's my job to show you how powerful that one is over the 20. Right. Right. So again, where, where do you attribute that? I mean, your point of view, that power that you're talking about wielding. I mean, okay. You shared your life with me a bit, but tell me where that where, where does that power come from to have that power of thought? You know, it, I think it's a combination of my mom and my dad. But if you were to ask any one of my siblings today. They're going to say, oh, my gosh, you just like that. I told you that's a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> but part of that, <laughs> part of that was I just remember those little moments I had with my dad. I tell any guy this, if you have a daughter, the best thing you could ever do is to sow this sort of power into them. And that's that belief. And my father used to say, come in, my little warrior. Come on over here, my little warrior. And, it, you know, for a long time, I thought I was really a warrior because he said so. Yeah. And Daddy said it must be so. Right. So so th th that goes back to, you know, him saying, I don't care if you're the only black on that school bus and you let them know what it's like to be black. I don't care if you're the only girl on this 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 team. Then you let them know what it's like to be a girl. You You, you know what I mean? So it was. That was embedded very early. And, and, and that's why 
you know, and I share this openly with a lot of women who've gone through sexual trauma in the military that, I, I, you know, I don't deny that those things in their sexual harassment is a lot of things. But one one thing I can tell you in the military, it, it is easy for women to feel a bit of isolation because you oftentimes will be the only one getting promoted, the only one in the room, the only, only, only. And I can't tell you how many times uh I had to force myself to exercise that power because if I didn't, then there was a bit of isolation that would have set in that would have not allowed me to achieve the greatest things that I was doing at that time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, because it leads right into this last question, which is you go into a room and you've got this power, you're the only one and people dismiss you. All right. Uh, across the board, just like you talked about being, you know, in the military as a woman and being isolated. You've got this power and you're being dismissed. How do you overcome that, Phyllis? Yeah, so so I, I, I would say this, I would say this is that, you know, so a lot, and that goes back to, I think people don't, they feel invisible or they don't feel heard. So there's one thing, I don't see you, nor do I hear you, right? And I would I would tell you this, is that um, if you're not, if you don't feel like people see you, that's because they don't hear you. And this goes back to what I said, is that are you willing to challenge the system that don't see you? I'm willing to challenge the system that don't see me because I can sit back all day long and say, you know, they don't see black people. They don't see women. They don't see this. But if, if but if, but if I don't, if I don't take my voice, because your voice allows you to be seen, um, your voice will trust me when you exercise the power that you have in your voice. And that's your perspective. That's what I'm talking about. The only comes with a perspective that no one else in the room has. And this and the system can be challenged when you when you go through that process. But but this takes um, let's just face it. I can say this all day long, but if you don't have the set of courage that travels with you every day, I get up and I say, what do I need to travel with today? What am I packing? It's like packing your lunch. What what are you traveling with? I, I know today I got a hell of a day. I better pack some courage because, boy, no, I'm getting ready to deal with some board members today, whatever. So I'm packing courage because I know I'm going to have to say things that make people uncomfortable, but I need the courage to do that. So I'm going to pack my courage and make sure I put a lot of it. Right. And maybe today I need integrity. Maybe I need candor. Maybe I need you got to know what it is you're packing so that you know what you have. You have tools to use. And it's what you're willing to use to show a different perspective that others don't have. Because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't, you, you just don't wake up and say, oh, God, I got power. <laughs> Along with power comes the tools to exercise the power. What tools are you using? And I'm going to tell you this is that I, um, somebody said this recently to me. The art, you have a, a art of persuasion like nobody I've ever seen. And, and that goes to you know, when somebody have a difference of opinion, I said, are you open to me sharing with you a perspective that you just don't have? Mm. And and most of the time, and they'll say, well, sure. Let me share this perspective coming from me. If it's from a woman, from a black, from whatever it is, I'll share that perspective. And I, and I say, you see how our perspectives are very different. Not that, not that either one of us is wrong, but I have been able to see your perspective. I don't think you would have been able to see my perspective had I not been the only woman in the room. You see, it's very different. And then it opens you up to, to have dialogue and healthy communication with people. And guess what? It may not happen the first time. Maybe, maybe they walk away and come back and say, you know, I gave that some thought, Phyllis, to what you were talking about a couple of weeks ago. Man, that stayed in my head all day. And I'm glad you shared that with me. And don't think that the results are going to happen overnight. It may be, but don't back down off your perspective. 
when you're trying to create change and impact. That's a lot of work, change and impact for people who, who understand this work. When you're trying to, to do this type of work, it does require a lot of you. Well, Phyllis Newhouse, thank you so very much. Uh, absolutely a pleasure to talk with you and to hear your insights. I know a lot of young people, a lot of people will be inspired by hearing your amazing story and your words of wisdom. Thank you so very much. And I hope at some point I can get a chance to talk to you again. Well, I would look forward to it. And I'll say this to all the young people out there. Remember, there's power in being the only. And, and remember your value card. Carry, carry it with you everywhere you go and know that your value card matters just as, ma as much as the other person in the room. This is The Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at The Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us.